Chapter 9, Molecular Biology. The structure of DNA was first written about by two individuals, James Watson and Francis Crick. The data that allowed them to reach their conclusions was actually collected by Rosalind Franklin in Maurice Wilkins Research Lab at King's College, which is in England, and by Erwin Schurgraff in an American research lab. Franklin took the image you see here. It's an x-ray picture of DNA from the top down, and Erwin Schurgraff found the pairing rules that dictate the structure of DNA. Now there are some other scientists that came up with some really great pieces of information about the structure of DNA, but figuring out its actual structure, putting all the clues together and writing it, is uh, the credit is given to James Watson and Francis Crick because they kind of took everyone else's individual puzzle pieces and made a whole picture. What they found was this general structure. Here's a single nucleotide of DNA. Proteins are chains of amino acids. Carbohydrates are chains of sugar. Nucleic acids are chains of nucleotides. And here's one nucleotide. A single nucleotide of DNA is made up of three units. A deoxyribose sugar, a phosphate molecule, and a nitrogenous base. Now the nitrogenous bases are interchangeable and the four of them make up the four nucleotides of DNA. There are two kinds of bases. You can see them split up here. The pyridinedines have just one carbon ring in their structure, and the two bases that fit in that category are called cytosine and thymine. The other bases are known as the purines. They're the larger structures. They have two rings apiece, and they are identified as guanine and adenine. DNA forms a double-stranded helix, and within the helix, we have very particular pairings of the nitrogenous basis. Adenine and thymine pair with one another, and cytosine and guanine always pair with one another. When you flatten out DNA, you get what you see here. Note that the sugar phosphate backbone and the bases along the middle that exist are in the, no, note the sugar phosphate backbone and then this, the bases that are occurring along the middle of the structure. A two-ringed base must pair with a single-ringed base. If not, you might end up with two of the smaller bases that can't physically reach across the space created by two two-ringed bases hanging out across from one another. And you would end up getting weaker bonds and weak spots in your DNA, which is quite dangerous. It turns out that this base pairing makes the DNA strong, but it also controls quite a bit about what actually happens in genetics. Another important thing to pick out in this picture here is the anti-parallel configuration of the DNA. Note the oxygen in the sugar and think of it kind of like an arrow at the top of that pentagram. One nucleotide points up while its partner nucleotide across from it is pointing down. This allows the nucleotides to hold this very particular structure and keep the bases safe on the inside. Here's another image depicting that configuration. The book uses the term complementary instead of anti-parallel. You'll see both, so just keep it in mind. Here you can see that a five prime end and a three prime end are noted. And that's just a reference to which part of the nucleotide is sticking out from the top of the strand. Chemists love labeling carbons. They have counted the carbons and labeled them in our individual nucleotides, focusing on the sugar. When you see a five prime or a three prime, they're just denoting a specific pot, a spot of the nucleotide. The three prime end can be thought of as the bottom of the nucleotide and the five prime as the, uh, as the top. It doesn't really work that way. There's no top and bottom to the structure. It's just a really easy way to organize it in your mind's eye. We can count the carbons again in this picture and you can see where this five prime and three prime is coming from. It's just an, it's a nomenclature thing essentially, but when you see a five prime end, you know, a five prime end on something is labeled, your arrow is pointing up. If you see that the three prime end is sticking out, your arrow is pointing down. So this picture is actually showing us the other important nucleotide, or part of it at least. The other important nucleotide is RNA. We've been talking about, about DNA.
And there are some, uh, big, some big differences between the two. The first one you see here, RNA has ribose sugar instead of deoxyribose. Note the little, the little O is missing. It also pairs with phosphates and nitrogen bases just like the other sugar. However, its bases are guanine, cytosine, adenine, and uracil instead of that thymine. It also generally exists as a single stranded molecule instead of that nice double helix like you saw in DNA. While DNA is the blueprint for most genetic information, RNA can be considered the workhorse. RNA makes up ribosomes. It shears messages from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm. And it also plays an important part in the control of intracellular messaging. When it comes to how DNA is kept, that is largely dependent on the type of cell. Prokaryotes keep their DNA loosely in an area known as the nucleoid. Eukaryotes protect their DNA in a core known as the nucleus. Generally speaking, it is unraveled into chromatin so it can be used to make gene products without a whole lot of extra work. When it's actively being used to make ribosomes, the construction site where you do that is what we know of as the nucleolus. Here's the organization of an eukaryotic chromosome. DNA, of course, is a double helix and it's wrapped around histone proteins that exist in units of eight. They're kind of packed like a little cube, and there are about 32 nucleotides wrapped around each one of those cubes. Now those histone and DNA units exist in little kind of beads on a string called nucleosomes. Nucleosomes can then be coiled into chromatin fibers, and when the fibers are condensed even more, eventually we refer to them as packaged chromosomes. During DNA replication, each of the two strands that make up the double helix serve as a template from which new strands are created. The new strand will be complementary to the parental or the old strand. It'll be its other half and have its exact matches. Each new double strand consists of one parental strand and one new daughter strand. This is known as semi-conservative replication. When two DNA copies are formed, they have an identical sequence of the nucleotide bases and are divided equally between the two daughter cells, half old and half new. Here you can see the process of DNA replication. We're going to run through this very slowly, but here's the basics so we know where we're going. First, a replication fork is formed by opening an origin of replication. In the case of eukaryotic organisms, there are a lot of these. An enzyme known as helicase separates the two DNA strands. An RNA primer is synthesized or added to the first little opening of the DNA strand and that allows another enzyme called DNA polymerase to attach to your DNA sequence. DNA polymerase zips down the DNA and adding, uh, zips down the DNA just adding bases. It's a little bit different on the other strand of DNA. They're both not copied the exact same way. And that's because of that five prime to three prime orientation. It turns out that the DNA polymerase can only build in one direction. Let's take a look at the individual steps. It might be a good idea to pause the video and jot down the basics of this picture so you have it in front of you as you listen. So. DNA replication. DNA replication is a very complicated process and it involves several, several enzymes and various proteins. It occurs in three main stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. There are specific nucleotide sequences called the origins of replication at which this process begins. Certain proteins bind to the origin of replication while an enzyme called helicase unwinds and opens up the DNA helix. Two Y-shaped structures are called replication forks are formed, little bubbles exist in the DNA, and they extend in both directions. Multiple origins of replication are created on eukaryotic chromosomes, which makes this process happen a whole lot faster. RNA primers are laid down to guide the next enzyme that's going to do its job. That enzyme is known as DNA polymerase. 
In the elongation step, DNA polymerase adds DNA nucleotides to the three prime end of the template. It's only capable of grabbing on physically to the three prime end of the template. It can only add new nucleotides at the end of a backbone primer sequence, which provides a very specific starting point. This primer sequence is removed later and replaced with normal DNA nucleotides. One strand, the strand that had the three prime end open for grabbing, is synthesized continuously, and that strand is known as the leading strand or the leading template. Because DNA can only synthesize in the five prime to three prime direction, remember if it's grabbing the three, it's adding the five, so we say it builds five to three prime, the other strand has to be put together in really short pieces called Okazaki fragments. Each tiny fragment requires its own primer made of DNA to start synthesis. These strands are known as the lagging strands. As synthesis proceeds, an enzyme removes the RNA primer, which is then replaced by DNA nucleotides. The gaps between the fragments are sealed by an enzyme known as DNA ligase. So what happens with that lagging strand is essentially you build the leading strand really fast and you get this long strand of DNA on the other side. And once you get kind of enough of it hanging out there, then you'll add an RNA primer, you'll add your DNA polymerase, and you'll build a whole bunch of DNA working in the five prime to three prime direction, but eventually you bump into that replication fork. So then you just wait you let the leading strand go for a little while, you let another big loop of DNA, un, you know, an uncopied loop of DNA be created, add another primer, add another polymerase, let it do its thing, and then let it copy until it hits that replication fork. And you just keep doing that over and over again. So it's always lagging behind because you have to wait for the little loop, and that's where it gets its name. DNA replication comes to kind of the end of a physical line in eukaryotic chromosomes. And that DNA enzyme, as you remember, can only add nucleotides in one direction. You have the leading strand with its continuous synthesis, then you have the lagging strand where there's no place uh, for the primer to be made eventually when you get to the end of the chromosome. Remember, you, you need that big old loop to copy backwards. So what happens is you end up with like a little tiny bit of DNA that doesn't get copied like every time because you have a little tiny end that was too little for a primer and too little for an, R an RNA polymerase to work backwards. So over time, these little ends, the whole end of the chromosome actually, it gets progressively shorter as the cell continues to divide. Well, thankfully our chromosomes have kind of, they've evolved to deal with this a little bit. The ends of linear chromosomes are known as telomeres. And a telomere is just a repetitive sequence. There's actually code for anything. So as a consequence, every time you copy your DNA, you go through replication, you just lose a little bit of that telomere. And it doesn't matter uh, for the longest time, but eventually you lose enough of your telomeres that those particular cells, they will actually, they'll choose not to divide anymore. They enter into something called G0 phase or quiescence, uh, and they just don't divide. Your body essentially doesn't want to risk copying the same piece of DNA too many times because you keep copying something eventually, like the quality of the copy degrades. And this is kind of like quality control. What we found is that the action of these telomeres and the fact that they get shortened, um, that's aging. The effects that you see with aging, it's because of this process, because of that lagging strand not being copied. We have found that the ends of some linear chromosomes can actually be maintained by an enzyme that's just called telomerase. So for an example, in human beings, we have a six base pair sequence. It's TTAGGG. In the end of your telomeres, you repeat that like a hundred to a thousand times. Well, it turns out that there is this enzyme that can attach to the end of a chromosome and the complementary bases of a DNA template are, it, are added thanks to this enzyme. And the lagging strand can actually end up being sufficiently elongated. So a fancy enzyme comes in 
and finds this little end of the chromosome repeat that I told you about just a second ago and it and it adds it. So it kind of does the job of DNA polymerase or it allows DNA polymerase to come and do its job even though it doesn't have that traditionally long lagging strand. So you can repair the ends of your chromosome. So you might be asking like, okay, you just said that you can't do that. So why are you now telling me that you can? Well, it turns out that telomerase is only active in extraordinarily young cells. We only want to fix extremely, extremely young cells. And older cells, they don't have this telomerase enzyme because stopping division in older cells is a really important part of ensuring that those cells don't become diseased in any way. And what we've actually found is that in certain types of cancer, telomerase activity has come back. Those cells didn't used to have telomerase activity, but then all of a sudden it started fixing these chromosomes, but it's not fixing the rest of the genetic material and errors are being allowed because this DNA should not have been copied anymore. And we end up with different types of cancer. It was this woman, Elizabeth Blackburn, that actually figured this out. She discovered how telomerase does her job and she won the Nobel Prize for it in 2009. I point this out uh, mainly because there's a lot about biology that we don't know yet. Sometimes in classes, students kind of, they're like, well, I mean, you're giving me all this information. Is there really anything left for me to study? And the answer is absolutely. We had no idea that this existed less than 10 years ago. So there's a lot of questions in biology that are, that are free to you to figure out. When it comes to this whole process of creating DNA, sometimes other mistakes happen. It's not just the telomeres that make this process look a little funky. So we have um, some issues that can occur, and thankfully we have the ability to proofread some mistakes if we do accidentally add the wrong nucleotide. So proofreading by DNA polymerase can correct really basic errors during replication. Sometimes we get you know little mismatched pairs, and we can cut out you know one nucleotide and add in the correct nucleotide. There's actually just a little it's a protein. It's just called the mismatch pair protein that detects these bases and they can move, remove them from the newly synthesized strands and add in the correct one. Um, something called nucleotide excision repairs something known as thymine dimers. So sometimes nucleotides are actually a little bit more interested in each other, like interested in the partner that's sitting next to them rather than the nucleotide that's across from the strand. And that's obviously a really big problem. You can see it in this picture. You get this, this weird bubble because the, the thymines aren't interacting with the adenines as they should be. They're interacting with each other. Well, thankfully we have a protein who can actually excise those thymines make sure they bond with the adenines and then smooth the molecule out. So there's a lot of neat little, little DNA repair tricks that we're finding as more effort is going into molecular biology research. It's really, it's really pretty cool. With that, I'm actually going to end part one of this chapter because it's the end of kind of a big topic that's a little tough to cover. So I'm going to very strongly suggest that you take a look at some other resources that discuss the copying and replication of DNA prior to moving on.